The world is at a pivotal moment. Geopolitical clashes have spawned an intense race for technology leadership. Industries are being reshaped. Globalization is being reimagined. I'm Andrew Schwartz. And I'm Kirti Gupta. We're here to break down how geopolitics and technology are impacting our economy, our security, and, and our, our daily, daily lives. lives. This, this is, is Geotech, Geotech Wars. Wars. Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of Geotech Wars. Unfortunately, my co-host Andrew isn't here with us today. He's basically lost his voice, so I'll be hosting by myself. And I am so excited here to welcome a special guest, Riva Gojon. I've worked with her in the past. She's the director at the Rhodium Group, where she leads client engagement and corporate advisory team and contributes to research on U.S.-China relations industrial policy, and China economic statecraft. She has deep bench expertise here. She's also a team member at Council on Foreign Relations, and she has two decades of professional experience as a geopolitical strategist, working on both with both business and government clients. So, Riva, welcome. Thank you, Kirti. And I really wanted to, you know, ask you a whole bunch of questions, taking a step back, at a time where a lot of action is happening on the chip side of the geotech wars, and we'll you know cover a different uh, set of issues as well. So let me let me start by the semiconductor chips because that you know we've covered this in the podcast before. Chips, the fuel of the modern economy, have been on the tip of the spear in terms of the tensions in U.S.-China relations because they are ultimately powering. Um, everything that we use, and the lot of focus on recent export controls from the U.S. government in order to limit tech transfer of critical technologies to China has been on what you and I call, as experts, leading node chips, which is high-end chips that go in, you know, high-end processing compute devices, AI processing systems, usually uh, 14 nanometer or smaller diameter, very complex technologies. And with a series of export controls, you know, starting from 2021, 22 to 2023, October being the latest one, their evidence is mixed on whether those export controls have worked in limiting this tech transfer and keeping China behind or not. More specifically, despite all these export controls we saw late last year, a Huawei device that was unveiled to the public uh, with a 5G chip. It was a seven nanometer chip and it performed remarkably well. So was this just a one-off deal? Was that, you know, capturing lightning in a bottle or is there more here? Yeah, this is, of course, the the question of the day in D.C., and I, I find it amusing that now in Washington you have lawmakers from all over talking about process nodes, and this is now such a, a common discourse compared to just two years ago. So, yes, everybody in Washington gets very excited every time there's a new teardown that reveals a new chip capability out of a Chinese chip maker. So as you just referenced, there was the the Huawei system on a chip that attracted a lot of attention, a seven nanometer class process node, presumably manufactured by SMIC, China's major chip maker. Even more recently, there were uh, there was a lot of attention around a potential five nanometer process node chip, but it turns out that was manufactured by TSMC. So This is where that nuance really matters because, of course, China's chip makers are going to give everything that they've got in trying to work around the the building controls and trying to demonstrate these breakthroughs, um, you know, to the policymakers above and in receiving more industrial policy funding to make these kinds of breakthroughs possible. And Huawei has just been like this phoenix rising, a pretty remarkable story given all the constraints it's been under as among the most heavily sanctioned Chinese entities out there. But what 
this picture looks like in the coming months is going to be really critical to watch, right? Because as we saw with the October 17th controls out of BIS, there was a lot of agility demonstrated by BIS and saying, you know what, we set the, the threshold here for high performance compute. It wasn't exactly where we want it now that we understand better from industry and what's been possible. So we're going to adapt this a bit, right? We're going to look at performance density. We're going to uh, just tweak things here and there. And then here are these new thresholds. And oh, by the way, here's a gray zone notification for companies to report in and as designed basically to deter, you know, major chip makers, NVIDIA, Intel, et cetera, from designing just below threshold chips for China. On the Chinese side, I think what's going to be really interesting to watch is how will the lithography controls contained in the October 17 package play out? Because that's where the U.S. extended an extra, extra long arm in basically saying, OK, where the Netherlands drew its line on export controls for DUV machines, deep ultraviolet lithography the U.S. said, OK, that's good, but not good enough. And it extended the controls unilaterally to capture older generation DUV. Now, we'll have to see what compliance looks like now moving forward. Will, for example, all the DV machines that China has been trying to get in country, how will those operate if, for example, we're not able to um, see repairs done, um, services done in the same consistency as before? something to test moving forward. And then, of course, the stockpiling effect. So some of these breakthroughs that have made the the headlines can also be attributed to stockpiling uh, manufacturing equipment, stockpiling chips, um, you know, that were not made in China, but by TSMC. So we'll need to to see moving forward. You mean, so, you know, having those tools and those technologies before the export controls took effect, but the question is, can right. can China keep up exactly. after these export controls? So let me quickly, you know, unpack a couple of things you said for our readers. You know, they may not know that in order to produce these very high node cutting edge chips, and again, they're important because you don't have high compute, you don't have AI capabilities, you don't have quantum compute without these high compute chips without processing and compute capabilities that they provide. Now, in order to produce those chips, you need something called lithography machines, which use light to print patterns on silicon wafers. And uh, very few companies, actually really only one company, <laughs> ASML in the Netherlands, is leading in this uh, technology area. And recently, the long arm that you mentioned, Riva, has, bas- has you know led to the U.S. reaching out, working with the Dutch government to have ASML restrict shipment of some of its chip making equipment to China, these lithography tools. So so I think you're saying, you know, verdict is still out on whether that most recent long arm control from the Dutch government, it just happened a couple of weeks ago, right? In early January. Well, so yeah, a couple of things here. The Netherlands did pass its own export controls following the October 7th controls that the U.S. did. Then the U.S. came on top of that with the October 17 controls from 2023. And that's where the extra long arm provisions were included. So what beyond where the Dutch went? And I don't think the Dutch were too happy about that, to be honest. Now we're kind of past that initial reactionary phase, now down to discussions around compliance, what this entails, and certain DUV machines were still allowed into China until year end, according to the Dutch controls, but not according to the U.S. controls. And so that's essentially what's at play. And I think when it comes to lithography, um, something that we've explained is that, you know, it's one thing to produce a smartphone chip. It's hard to do, of course, at the smaller and smaller process node. But you can squeeze quite a bit out of uh, in using a DUV machine to produce a smartphone chip, as China has been doing through a process called multi-patterning. But to produce a chip for data center, right, for AI processing. So now we're at the real tip of the spear in high performance compute. That is much, much harder. And that's where that DUV threshold becomes a lot more problematic for China and where you need more high-end technology for the lithography component. Okay, so we, we, have to, we have to maybe in six months' time see if there is another shockwave coming where, you know, we see another, like we got a mobile phone chip from China, the, the, the Huawei chip that made these shockwaves happen, but hopefully we won't get 
you know, another kind of such shock. Or if we do, then we have to know that these export controls have limits <laughs> in, uh, in how much they seem to be working. So that's wait and watch. Uh, that's helpful. And another, you know, point that we often miss talking about in this discussion is the importance of older technology. So these are, you know, you and I have been talking about high-end mobile phone chips or AI processing chips that go in data centers. But as you and I know, Riva, as uh, people in our industry know, most of the chips that people use in cars and planes and home appliances, broadband, consumer electronics, etc., are what we call older node legacy chips. What you know, the Chips and Science Act defines as 28 nanometer or larger diameter. There, China has the expertise. In fact, they have quite a bit of market share in the manufacturing of those chips. And we have really neglected expanding in the United States our manufacturing capabilities in that area, right? A lot of the focus recently with the CHIPS Act, with you know the government money infusing in to help industries add more investment is focused on that, what you and I have been talking about, like leading edge, high-end technology, cutting edge chips. But the legacy is where most of the action is. So what are the big issues there and where are we compared to China? So legacy chips are now the new focal point in in Washington. And so the policy discussion has caught up. One thing that we've been drawing out is the uncomfortable fact that the U.S. has virtually no foundry capacity for legacy chip manufacturing. And so 80 percent, for example, of foundry capacity for 20 to 45 nanometer process nodes is in China and Taiwan combined. For 50 to 180 nanometer process nodes, China and Taiwan together control around 70 percent of foundry capacity globally. And China has been building out that capacity rapidly because this is an area where it can play, right? This is not where export controls are focused. And this is where China can, can produce at lower cost. And so wants to sustain that momentum and dig into areas that it, where it's trying to grow into, like automotive chips, where there are higher um, safety and reliability standards to meet to get the kind of buy-in that you need from OEMs, right, for those long-term contracts. And so they are actively pursuing these areas. Now, from a U.S. policy standpoint... This is a problem in that legacy chips are, as you said, in everything. And the the policy question of the day is how do you incentivize U.S. companies in particular from diversifying their sourcing away from China for legacy? It's also not comfortable to have so much of that um, capacity concentrated in Taiwan as well, just given cross-strait tensions. But there is growing scrutiny over SMIC, for example, in China and, and having just a growing presence in this market. And this is where policymakers, I think, will have to get creative in how to address this because legacy chips already by definition from the Chips Act guardrails, as you said, 28 nanometer and above, that's been defined. If we look at export controls, if we look at outbound investment screening, the focus on the whole is on what's considered leading edge where the U.S. has drawn the line at 14 nanometer and below. So now what do you do for these uh, more mature process nodes? And this is actually where I think you're going to see more trade defense come into play, meaning here's the buzzword that you're going to hear over and over again in this year. It's level playing field measures. What does that mean, right? Well, there's a trend here, not just limited to legacy chips, but EVs and batteries and wind turbines and biodiesel and heat pumps and medical products, you name it. But areas where China has been rapidly building up manufacturing capacity, at the same time, its own economy has been contracting. And so that creates a overcapacity effect. And then China is exporting cheaper product abroad. That, of course, then triggers trade defenses, especially among G7 advanced economies. And that's where you get things like the EU uh, anti-subsidies probe into China-made EVs. And then the next step of that is China responds to those actions with retribution, for example, by restricting critical inputs in clean tech supply chains. And so this is a cycle that's in motion. 
And for legacy chips, this is an interesting area where where commerce is weighing in, in particular, in seeing how to, one, understand the current dependencies on China for legacy chips, and two, to potentially see where trade defense measures could be activated. So let me unpack that a little bit. So for these kinds of older technology legacy chips, the ROI, return on investment, is probably the lowest in the semiconductor supply chain. So it is not like there's a natural incentive that already exists for U.S. companies to play in that area or to manufacture in that area, right? Yeah. On top of that, there's this additional problem that, you know, the Chinese products may be cheaper, A, because of efficiencies, or there's always an arbitrage in the international market. Some places are cheaper than others in terms of labor. And B, because of this oversupply effect that is exacerbating the issue that you're describing, right? That they have an oversupply of these chips already because their domestic industry has shrunk, putting a further downward pressure on these prices and therefore putting a further disincentive for the U.S. farms to enter an already less profitable area. So what do we do? <laughs> We have to resort to some kinds of trade tariffs to artificially increase those prices so that we are creating some incentives, at least domestically, to produce those chips. Tough call. <laughs> yeah. And there's a really noteworthy argument that commerce is making in a proposed rule on strengthening trade remedies in that it's arguing that not only are there particular market distortions created, um, you know, obviously it's with an eye toward China on the overcapacity front, but also that the lack of labor, environmental, human rights, IP protections all together lower the cost of production in China in ways that harm U.S. industry. And so that is the argument that I think you're going to see being carried forward and now we have upcoming uh, USPR statutory four-year review of the Section 301 investigation, which focused a lot on IP theft and forced tech transfers. Now think about that applied to a broader theory of harm on level playing field measures, everything that we've been talking about here, not just around the IP theft issue. And what does that mean for the toolkit? And this is where also where the House Select Committee on China has been inquiring to USPR and commerce on what authorities does each have when it comes to applying something called component tariff. So actually applying a tariff to the product containing the legacy chip itself. And at, from a broader perspective, from a US perspective, if we don't find a way to resolve this dependence on China for the legacy chips, we can do whatever we want on the leading on the, you know, high-end type of technologies. But if we are ultimately reliant on uh, import of chips for majority of our products, then that's leverage, right? That's leverage of all kinds that allows retaliation in all kinds of ways that's, uh, that can, again, just halt the modern economy. Yeah, and that's the coercive leverage argument that certainly comes front of mind whenever cross street tensions start to to flare up. You know, we see tensions in the South China Sea. So anything that could turn into a conflict situation to where both sides are looking at where they can exercise different levers, this is, of course, one of the, the areas now under scrutiny, um, just given those legacy chip dependencies. And this is why this chips thing has become so important. It's really what our geopolitical axis is spinning on. So, you know, switching gear towards that, the geopolitical flashpoints, let's talk a little bit about the China-Taiwan dynamic, you know. So Taiwan, interesting country with uh, 90 plus percent of world's foundry or manufacturing capability for these high-end chips basically residing in Taiwan, it's usually called the silicon shield, you know, with this uh, high-end capabilities that Taiwan has in semiconductors, giving the world a big reason to defend the island. So how is that playing out right now with Taiwan investing, or TSMC, the biggest foundry in Taiwan, investing more and more in manufacturing capabilities outside of Taiwan, particularly in the United States? So whenever you have smaller powers wedged up against the big powers and trying to manage a very tough geopolitical environment, you'll usually find a lot of agility and a lot of balancing. 
And here's where Taiwan is demonstrating that quite well in that, of course, it is keeping the crown jewels at home. And this was actually a big part of the election campaign where the incumbent party, the DPP, was on the defensive and saying, look, I'm not just, you know, selling off the crown jewels and listening to what the Americans are demanding over here. Taiwan will remain the leader in semiconductor manufacturing. But at the same time, there is certainly uh, you could call it a security or geopolitical down payment being made in the form of TSMC fabs in the U.S., of course, help incentivized by um, the CHIPS Act. And in Japan, very important partnerships in play. Japan sees this as a great opportunity, right? I mean, it kind of lost out on the logic chip wave. Um, it lost out on the memory chip wave to the Koreans. And so this is kind of like Japan's comeback tour and saying, all right, hey, TSMC, come back, come in, invest. Uh, let's also focus on automotive chips, areas where we already have really strong industry, really important partnerships being forged there. And then also even um, TSMC, TSMC investment in Europe, although we'll have to see with Germany's budget crisis whether they'll be able to follow through on some of those big commitments. But uh, it effectively, yeah, I, I see a balance here and it makes just a ton of sense given the position that Taiwan is in ge geopolitically. And the recent election in Taiwan and the, you know, as expected results, does that change any balancing act? I think you're going to see a lot more of, you know, continued attention toward security partnerships in building up Taiwan's defense, also making sure that there are economic incentives on top of that. So, for example, Taiwan has been asking the U.S. to get through an agreement um, to avoid double taxation. So if TSMC is going to be investing in the U.S., it doesn't want to be doubly taxed. These are issues, sticky issues that need to be worked out and that Congress is trying to move through, which China can react to. Stepping back um, with this election result in Taiwan, status quo doesn't just mean de-escalation by any means. Status quo still means incremental escalation with the potential for flare-ups. And there's a $19 billion backlog of U.S. weapons shipments that will be unwinding and making its way to Taiwan. And for every single one of those, we need to watch the sensitivity of those shipments and how China can respond, sometimes symbolically, as we've seen. But we can also see some more serious moves as well. Thank you, Reba. And let's, you know, speaking of geopolitical flashpoints, let me take your attention from the U.S. and Asia Pacific to the middle of the world to Middle East. You know, the recent Israel-Palestine conflict and the Houthi rebels in the Red Sea and the Suez Canal are disrupting some of the global trade flows. Are there big implications for global tech competition from that potential conflict that's, you know, turning out to be more than a local conflict to something which has global implications. Are there some takeaways here for Israel's relationship with China on the tech side? Yeah, I think so. A couple angles here. One is the U.S. has been applying pressure on Israel to distance itself more from Chinese tech investment. And this, for example, has manifested in ways to have like getting Israel to tighten up its inbound investment screening. So China, for example, has very significant investments in Israel's port infrastructure. And so the U.S. has raised some alarm over that. Now, with, you know, the Gaza war in play with the Houthi attacks on commercial vessels at play, and the Houthis see this as a grand opportunity to increase their relevance. They're emboldened by each airstrike. And so this is not going to be easy to wind down. But all in all, this is also casting a lot of uh, tension on China's relationship with Iran. And there's been scrutiny in Israeli media as well over whether China is getting safe passage through the Bab al-Mandab with the Houthis, through its relationships, things like that. Now, all of this is to say that um, Israel is not happy with China um, and it, the diplomatic positioning it's taken around the Gaza crisis and around what's happening in the Red Sea. And so that may be an opportunity for the U.S. to leverage in, in trying to create more distance between Israel and China, especially as the U.S. has grown concerned over technology cooperation and tools that can be applied in this more digital authoritarianism setting. So, you know, countries that have restive populations that may lean toward 
um, more repressive measures, surveillance technologies, things like that, and wanting to to drive a wedge between Israel and China on the technology front, at least. And so we'll need to see how that plays out. So in addition to all this ground that we've covered, Riva, I know that at Rhodium Group, you are working on so many different cutting edge issues like this. For example, how are all these geopolitical tensions and events affecting not just the semiconductor chip industry, but other industries? Could you give us a little bit of a teaser before we bring you back on? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, there's a lot uh, t- that we're we're sinking our teeth into to include gaming out entanglements for the connected and autonomous vehicle industry and all the players along that value chain. We're looking at biotech applications and implications for cloud service providers. There is just so much where you can see the high performance compute AI segment come together in a really interesting way, but also um, that's going to throw up a lot of questions for for policymakers in the next three to five years. So we want to stay ahead of that. We're definitely going to have to bring you back. So I hope to see you in a few months once we have some of these developments played out a little bit more to talk about. Thank you so much for joining us today in our studio, Riva. We will see you soon. My pleasure, Kirti. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Geotech Wars. You can listen to more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to great content. Don't forget to rate and review us. Until next time.